Here is an image of Kathy, who you studied with and worked with. And this is one of the images that I, you know, also think you can see the mirror and you can see, it's sort of difficult to tell, but you can see that that's her mother reflected in the mirror. So taking the photo of LaToya, who's wearing a Cosby family t-shirt, um, which I love, and it's those details that, I ta that I'm talking about. It's like, at first you think, oh, it's you know, just this t-shirt and she's wearing you know, this long sort of robe, but in reality it's like there's all this hidden meaning. And I love these pictures because there's also one next that has the actual camera in the image. But so when you were studying with Kathy, how much, I mean, I know she introduced you to a number of photographers, but how much did her personal, because she did, she did similar things. She photographed herself. She photographed her family and her mother who was suffering from Alzheimer's. And so she also turned the camera on herself. And was that sort of the, the, the moment that you thought that you kind of put all of those pieces together from when you learned that from her? Well, actually, Kathy never showed her work. She only showed her work and talked about it one time. Wow. <clears throat> and what was so powerful about that, uh, Kathy committed, uh, just an amazing teacher, teacher excellence beyond belief. <laughs> this woman would have you in a class at 6 o'clock on a Wednesday until 11 o'clock at night. You had to have perfect prints. They had to be spotted, mounted, matted. You had to have an artist statement. And people critiqued your work, and you had to be quiet and deal with the criticism. And then you spoke at the end. <laughs> I mean, this is someone who would push you to your furthest limit to do whatever you needed to do to make that photograph. And, um, you know, Kathy uh, passed away um, unexpectedly from cancer as well. And it wasn't until after uh, her passing that I get access to uh, all of her images where I edited a two-person show called Honoring Insight, The Impact of Kathy Kowalski. And as I went through her book, her, her boxes and portfolios, that's when I saw that this woman, <laughs> through, through a spirit, had brought all of this understanding to me. Like it was destiny and meant for her to be in my life. It was Kathy who told me to go photograph my mother and my grandmother. Mm. I had started out making the portraits of my mom, but I was so ashamed of showing them in the classroom because I was the only black student, a woman coming from severe poverty during the war on drugs. So the images weren't flattering and they were difficult. And I was ashamed to show him. She knew that I was hiding my work. <laughs> and she pulled me aside in her class one day into her office. She didn't say too much. She handed me three books. She handed me um, Eugene Richards' Cocaine True, Cocaine Blue, which is a book that people argued about for many years because he made these black and white harsh images of people abusing drugs in Red Hook in Brooklyn. And then, she handed me Larry Clark's Tulsa, mm. which is about him and his friends on all their drugs, hanging out together. And then she handed me Carrie Mae Weems' uh, exhibition from the 90s. It was a catalog someone did. And again, without saying too much, you know when a mentor hands you three distinctly different bodies of work by very different artists that you've been charged with a responsibility. Yeah. She gave them to me and she said, it is very valid for you to photograph yourself and your mother and your grandmother, and that's what made me really do it. And then when she passed and I discovered the rest of her work, you know, I just wanted to keep honoring her life and her teaching with my work so that she wouldn't be a forgotten woman. Um, often they go underrepresented yeah. and they never gave her the retrospective she deserved, and so I went back and brought the attention back and they finally gave her the retrospective at the Erie Art Museum, which is where her work is uh, still housed today in the museum. And here's the image I was talking about with the camera and the view of LaToya and her mother, again, you know, using the mirror, which is propped up on the radiator, you know, the curtain pulled to the side, just a stunning, you know, and that, it's so interesting to me. I, I had always assumed that Kathy had shared her work with you because you look through it and the, the sort of links between the two, it's uncanny. I mean, even this, 
like even this portrait of her mother who is here, you know, it's she's suffering from Alzheimer's and she would photograph her mother through this whole process and here she is showed without her shirt on and even to think of the images that you've taken of yourself, you know, in moments of illness and the images you've taken of your mother, I mean it really is shocking to me but in a in a good way, you know? I think it's it's really special when you meet someone who you connect with on such a deep level that you don't need it all sort of laid out there. Mm -hmm. They just sort of, they give you little offerings and it just takes you along, right? Yeah. <laughs> and the other thing that Kathy had also done, since this was a state school in Pennsylvania, we had very small intimate classes. So she would bring someone like Bell Hooks. I mean, Bell came at two different times. I mean, and how amazing is that to be in a small classroom and then you get to hang out with bell hooks and you're learning about feminist discourse with mm -hmm. bell. Um, and so even when you see the images of my mom photographing us in the mirror or me wearing the, the Huxtables t-shirt, it was my way of kind of nodding and thinking about, you know, where do I stand when it comes to class, mm. right? Because I, I was having a, an internal class struggle conflict. On the one hand, you know, my family's being weighed down by all this poverty and systemic and institutional racism. And on the other hand, I was able to use the photographs, you know, to get an education and to get me through. And there's a responsibility that comes with that. And so often these images are also looking back at that, right? Struggling with that identity um, and also with the class issues, right? I would watch the Huxtable show to escape my reality but at the same time when you look at that photograph that image of the huxtables is faded mm -hmm. it's tethered it's worn away it's also another type of double mirror a double yep. image and the irony is that history and time changes the meaning of a photograph what that photograph meant when i took it in 2008 it was just <laughs> an argument i had with my mom and one of my college buddies about the Cosby show. She's like, well, put the, put the t-shirt on. Let's make a portrait of it. You know, and I taught my mom how to photograph. So when you're seeing the double portraits of my mother and I, that's actually her shooting the portraits. Yep. And we were trying to figure out, you know, how do you take these domestic settings and shoot them in a way where they're still interesting? Mm -hmm. So we started using them like, like a studio space, like a stage. Um, well, and you would move things, right? You would move things to construct very specific images. So sometimes the mirrors are placed in very specific... Well, that mirror was always on the radio. <laughs> We're the ones moving with it. But what's interesting, <laughs> and, it's, and it's Gramps' mirror. It's his mirror. Is it? So there's always objects being moved around as someone passes away. But the thing about that image is that if you stand in front of it, you, the viewer, become you become the person that's yeah. actually in the position of the camera or the person who would be shooting it. She's actually behind me in the doorway in that image and the mirror makes it seem like she's in front or it seems like I'm in front of her. So it's always bringing the viewer in. So if you stand in front of them, you're really, it's you, you're in it with mm -hmm. us, right? You're accountable, a contract happens between you and the image and us when you're putting your own gaze onto it. So they become very intimate and they draw you in. And again, it's not about me presenting, you know, me and my mother to you. It's more about me inviting you in to put yourself in our shoes, mm -hmm. right? We're in the same place. Well, and I think also thinking back about these domestic spaces, um, it's the, the sort of tightly cropped images. Though the space becomes important, I think often when you're looking at an image of an interior, there's so much information that often it, it either competes with or you know takes over the figures, but that's impossible in any of your images, unless that's the purpose of it. You know, there's little details and little tells, but other than that, it's like the figures really sort of carry the space. And something that I've been, I just was thinking about, and might be too personal of a question, but I wonder how the relationship between, like if the relationship shifted after you started making photos with each other, with you and your mother and your grandmother. I mean, was there ever a moment that this, that the dynamic changed at all since there, it was more of a collaboration, you know, rather than like daughter, mother, grandmother, sort of hierarchy in a way? Well, again, my grandmother was very 
yes. skeptical of these <laughs> things. And, you know, she hated a few images, so yeah. they're not they're not present because she didn't <laughs> like them. Um, but my mother and I, it's interesting. But overall, these images are actually all portraits. What I what I'm showing you, and the reason you see a doubling of the portrait and the figure. It's not that I'm making a distinction between the three of us as separate people. I'm looking at us as one portrait, one entity of time, right? As women who existed in this, this, this continuum and this history of this small town, right? So my grandmother living there in mm -hmm. the 30s when it was a melting pot and prosperous, and my mother living there in the 50s during the height of like the segregation and white flight and redlining, and then me being there in the 80s during, you know, the major crisis of the war on drugs and when the factories are all gone. Like, thinking about the fact that the three of us embody a 21st century experience of what it's like. And mm -hmm. for me to come of age post Reagan administration policies without knowing it because I was a teen, but yet capturing it in these images is what becomes important when you look at them, right? And they're just as much landscapes as they are portraits. Um, if you go, if you could go back again. Yeah, of course. Often in these images, d these are during holidays, right? Because I'm also in college, so I'm coming mm -hmm. back and forth during breaks, which are always during holidays. And it's ironic that they're devoid of any type of holiday chair or spirit. <laughs> but we are having a good time. <laughs> um, and then the other thing is that we all have terminal illnesses. And uh, I think there's something to be said about you know, often people want to have the argument about the female gaze and the male gaze yep. and painting and, and portraiture, and I'm not having that conversation. Um, I'm, I'm kind of taking those formal and aesthetic qualities, usurping them and owning them and updating them in my way. But for me, what I'm doing is documenting our demise and our health and our body <clears throat> deteriorating along with the social and economic fabric of Braddock as that industry collapsed and we were abandoned for all those years. And so that is also why these become like landscapes. Mm -hmm. um, especially, I don't know if we have the one where we're standing side by side with the floral comforter mm -hmm. behind us. I'm gonna go but forward like, to it. Sure, I mean, th those are like, um, like this image here. I mean, it's very much a landscape, yep. right? This very painterly portraiture. But what it is is the mattresses, mm -hmm. right? Going back to, thinking about how to keep a domestic space interesting. So we take the mattresses, we stand them upright, we drape them with the comforter, and then we're standing in front of this textile print that you're not sure if we're laying on it where we are. And you know, it's this floral pattern that makes you think a lot about textile industry. Mm -hmm. The floral pattern makes you think about landscape. It has this poetic light air to it. But then also we're standing there side by side She's fighting cancer, I'm fighting lupus. We're both very ill. She just came out of the hospital. I'm just recovering from a lupus attack. And then we stand together, you know, in camaraderie as a mother and daughter, documenting this moment. Well, and I may just move forward from here because I think it's also, although we should show a couple of Carrie Mae Weems photos, so I'm gonna go back just for a second. So Carrie Mae Weems, you know, did this, I mean, she's done a number of works, but the, the works, um, that m many people know her from are the um, kitchen table series where she sets up all of these different scenes and what I find so stunning about this series is that there's a number of different photos but in every one it's the exact same thing it's the kitchen table it's the figures depends sometimes it's mother maybe daughter husband the sort of relationship you think you understand based on the interaction and then the single light hanging but in every single one you're getting a completely different feeling like sometimes there's anger sometimes there's disappointment sometimes there's boredom and you're getting a sense of the relationship between the figures and the scene all through it's almost like watching a play in a way when you're looking through each sort of image and so you know, when I think of this series, I think a lot about the way that you use the home and that the, you use, you know, the various sort of, the, especially the double portraits of you and your mother, the way that you begin to become more performative with them and you begin to really play, you know, like in this one, with the ways in which you're, you're kind of mirroring each other to show the relationship and to show the dichotomy between you two. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is, yeah, this is, I think this is the first work that came into the ICA's collection. 
Yes. Yes. I wanted the ICA to have that because I had such a wonderful time with Anna. Oh, so it was a gift of LaToya. You yes. so great. It was really amazing. But sorry. But um, this is, I think this is, you know, to show, I, you know, when you're looking at all of these photographers, and I think Carrie Mae Weems is part of it, uh, is where performance comes into play. And though it's not a live performance, but you begin to see that it's, it, they, they shift a little bit. Right, and the way that you're playing with your, the way that you're sort of placing your bodies in relation to each other. Right, I mean, you know, Carrie, I studied with Carrie at uh, Syracuse University. Um, and again, you know, the irony of that, considering that Kathy gave me that book well before I knew I would be studying with Carrie. I didn't even know Carrie was in Syracuse when I arrived. But um, yes, there's that dynamic and social contract in that play that happens right, the power struggle mm -hmm. between two people. It becomes emblematic of also just the power of who's making the image and who's speaking. And so when you look at this portrait here, I often noticed, um, you know, I feel like it's my generation of, of women who, if there were things that, you know, you don't air dirty laundry or you don't talk about these kinds of things in, in public, uh, it was my generation that kind of challenged that. The, mm -hmm. All the girls I was meeting at college, everyone, we would have these sister circles and we would talk about all these issues. And so, you know, when you see an image like this, I taught my little niece how to photograph. So my niece, this is like a huge <laughs> family thing. Like either my mother's boyfriends have to photograph us or there's like a family member. If me and my mom are shooting and someone is there, they have to work. And so my <laughs> niece is actually shooting this for us because I wanted to make sure we were lined up. So again, thinking about who gets to speak and who's silent or thinking about the, the, the mental illness or psychological damage from you know, poverty and abuse. Um, really just ov overlapping that and showing that, that tension and you know, who's the protector and you know, at the end of the day, you only have one mother, and this is, this is my mom, and I'm honoring her. But also, I mean, it also makes the shape of a heart. Mm -hmm. So like, there's just so much uh, cruel and tender back and forth moments that happen. And this is the reality, I think, of a lot of mother-daughter <laughs> relationships. There's always a struggle, a wrestling, a tension that occurs. But more so, you know, who gets to see and who gets to speak and who mm -hmm. breaks that silence. Well, and just the way that your lips are, you know, the connection of the lips and the connection of the nose and the intimacy, I think, of the image as well is what I, what has really kind of hit me when I saw this work in person. Um, so we talked about this. And so here's another, I put these together. So Carrie Mae Weems also did this series where she stands in front of these institutions where the sort of African-American or black voice has been absent. And so she'll stand in front of the Louvre and she'll stand in front of other institutions, but it's always looking towards it. And so you're only getting the image of her from the back. And so it's the silhouette. And so we were scrolling through earlier and Latoya was like, I wonder, like, it's so weird that you put these two together. But, you know, this uh, series that Latoya and her mother did where they're, you know, it's the silhouettes of the two of them behind this sheet. I think of these very much in line with each other of what this, um, what the what bodies can do in space and the power that they can hold and the power that they can carry and so the Carrie Mae Weems the this series sometimes you know her figure is quite small so you're looking at this building and you're like oh that's the Louvre or oh I get this and then you see this powerful sort of stoic figure standing confronting it and I thought the same thing about it's almost you know there's moments of of play and playfulness but also an immense power that comes through this mommy silhouette series as well and it's you know it's a large scale grid of images and and i think it was one of the pieces in the show that i came back to over and over again because it's so unique in that body or at least from that show and it's I, it just there's something about it that i think you know when there is the sheet in front of you what what you what your body is able to do a little differently than when it's fully exposed. I don't know. And I, I so I was I would be interested to hear sort of your thoughts in my connecting these two images 
and what you think about sort of the silhouette and the body in these in these kind of more expansive spaces well in a spiritual and poetic sense i think that even the way that Carrie is standing framed by that doorway and the black door with the white frame and the way my mother and I are behind the mm -hmm. light that's blowing out the, the sheet that's making it such a halo. Um, you could almost look at those like black stars or black, black holes, mm -hmm. right? Something that far exceeds the flesh. Um, and then on the other hand, there's the invisibility factor and then on that literal sense of the image, the way that my mother and I made those images, I always come back to it because I feel like it's always telling me something. You know, photographs, I had once asked Kathy before she passed, how will I know that I'm making strong work? And she said, you'll know because the work will speak back to you. Hmm. It'll start to take you places. And this image, no matter how many times I look at it, I'm learning something new from it every time. And I'm often learning things that maybe I don't want to see, maybe I don't want to know. And that's the power of photography and art, when it looks back at you and shows you something that you don't see within yourself because you're just not ready to see that. But here in this case, this was one of the last images my mother was healthy enough to make with me and she wasn't going to make it. She had happened to come out of her bedroom and she sees me taking this duct tape, trying to tape this sheet up to the wall. And she's like, what are you doing? And I was like, oh, I'm going to try to make this portrait. Um, do you want to make it with me? No, leave me alone. I don't want to be bothered. And then she kept, she kept, so I went on, kept duct taping and she kept looking over and she sees the light go up behind the sheet and she comes in. She's like, okay, go, go behind the sheet, go behind the sheet. I'm going to, I'm going to shoot this. So what's happening in the series, it's about five feet by four feet, because it's a grid of the nine images that are 19, 16 by 20. And so what she's doing is asking me to align myself with all the different, uh, the birds and the nature that you see on the sheet. So I followed her instructions and I kept like moving my hand and my body <laughs> doing this. And um, you know, when I put them all together and you start to look at them, it's, it, it almost like evokes a type of eco-feminism or thinking about, again, industry or how the textile is made mm -hmm. and then seeing the nature and the fact that this is synthetic. It's a, it's a cotton, it's something brought together and then how that symbolized the outside and the inside again. Because for me, invisible women in this community that's written off that no one sees and your, your, your shadows, your ghosts. Yeah. So it has this poetic thing. So it has a soft and a hard edge to it and all these multiple meanings. Well, and how much power the stance can have, you know? And I think every time I came back to it, I was, I would see something new and I would find, I would say like, it would be some sort of different sense I would get from each of the, I think of them as, you know, frames in a way almost from, it's like you could line them up and it could be some sort of film or something. I mean, really. Like film still. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And then there's a power and a defiance to it, but then also um, something that's genderly and tender yeah. and soft and vulnerable yeah. to them. So it always keeps shifting. Yeah. So um, now we'll talk about Carnegie and John Frazier and little Latoya. Yeah, so that's one of the outfits that my grandmother <laughs> did. So you can see there in the middle there, like, you know, grandma dressing me up like a porcelain doll on a Sunday and taking a picture of it. <laughs> and so this triptych here comes from um, the images I sourced from a book uh, done by Arcadia Publishing. This publishing company does books all over the US on small towns. And so I happened to buy this book and this image of Andrew Carnegie was in it, and then the image of John Fraser, who was the Scotsman that existed before the camera. So there's just the plaque when you come to the town, and the plaque is actually right in front of the uh, factory. But when I looked through that book, I noticed that you know this book is published in 2008. It's 100 something pages, and by the time I get to the end of the book, there were absolutely no African Americans in it. And it's 21st century, and we're still making history books completely omitting populations that contributed to the history and the making of a place and of an economy, right? So 
that was like the moment where I was like, oh my God, I'm not innocently making these portraits with my mother and my grandmother. It's, it's not like innocence. It has a purpose and yeah. the purpose was larger than me. And so I needed to really evolve and mature with the work. Now there was a new accountability. Now it's, oh, you're in the position to speak back to history. Mm -hmm. You're in the position to put yourself in the center of these grand narratives, of these pillars, of these historic men. How do you insert yourself in a space where there's no room and where you're not permitted? So, you know, a triptych like this, I mean, these are raster etched into aluminum plates that are mounted on wood, almost like how you would see a placard. But placards are usually for historic figures. Like, I have no business being in this placard with these men. <laughs> So I thought it was wonderful to, <laughs> to do that. So like even when you open my book, you open to this little trip, triptych booklet insert, and that's how the book brings you in. So inserting myself in between these men. Um, I know we're, because I feel like we could talk for hours and we're getting, we're nearing the end, but one thing that I want to make sure that everyone sees, and so we'll kind of go through these a little bit quicker just so you get a sense of them, is that while LaToya and her mother and her grandmother would photograph themselves, often in states of illness, as a representation of the sort of pollution and the damage that the steel mills did to Braddock, it also did, she, she did the opposite of that. So she began to photograph Braddock as well. And the various, here's Charles Sheeler, just to show some more connections, but also, you know, would begin to photograph Braddock to show the damage to the actual landscape and the city and how buildings were being torn down and how entire neighborhoods were disappearing and these are places that people were living and so LaToya began to photograph those as well. So those in conversation, it's almost as though your family and Braddock became metaphors for each other through the work. Um, but this in particular, right? Yeah. So this is a, a, a silver gelatin print by Charles Schiller who is, a, is also a painter that painted for the Ford Company. Right. Right, so his work heroicizes and you know celebrates the industry. If you go back one slide, mm -hmm. this image here, the image of the bottom, that's you know my photograph, and it's showing a post-Fordist economy. Right, you see the Mercury, the Grand Marquis sitting there, and then the Bach gases, light industry. And the other thing about the power of photographs or looking at landscapes as they're shifting is there is an invisible history always enveloped there. Kind of like how celluloid fo forms on a film when you develop it. There's already some residue, some other factual thing that you can't see, especially if you don't know a place. And this site also, I came back to this intersection every time I was home because that's where I grew up in the projects called the Talbot Towers, but they tore it down and the black families came together under the Saunders consent decree to file a lawsuit against Allegheny County for housing discrimination because they were keeping us in very harmful hazardous sites next to the factory and they kept building more industry around us, which of course is which has led to a lot of our terminal illnesses. But an image like that, one wouldn't know if they weren't from there, but for me to actually concentrate on it and to really pick it out and shoot it the moment that I did, right, with that type of haze that's mm -hmm. there from all the toxicity, or the way that the marquee marks a very specific period, or the way that it has its own visual language opposite of when we look at the Schiller paintings that heroicize industry, mm -hmm. mine on the other hand shows you the results right. of that type of uh, heroicism and the fact that of all that neglect and all the degradation from the industry. Well, and it's also in many of these images and in many of these photos, there's this absence of humans. Like people, I don't know if it was the time, but there just are no people on the streets. And so also I find that to be something um, significant in these landscape images where the body is so present in the self-portraits and portraits, whereas in these, the body is totally absent. And you can feel the weight of both of those things, which is what, when you see a show of the works together, makes them so powerful and so significant. 
And so this is the UPMC Braddock Hospital that was the only hospital in Braddock. And they, as you can see, tore it down. And so the, you know, of course the people who were in poor health were also some of the poorest because they were in the neighborhoods that were, that they were being poisoned. And so their only source of health care was then demolished. And so LaToya did a series of photos of the process of the demolition and of the protests that occurred as well. Um, I will go back for a minute. Um, so it was important to move from these very intimate portraits on a, on a micro level, an intimate level, to then kind of expanding. So coming out onto the street, starting to engage and deal with protests with people on the street, and then to go up to these aerial views. And so moving from the micro to the macro level to show that this was much larger, but also this microcosm mm -hmm. that we were all sharing within this small town, even though there were parallel realities happening. But more so importantly, you have the United <coughs> States still on one hand, polluting the town that employed people and controlled people's bodies. And then you have UPMC, the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, who now is the, one of the largest nonprofit global healthcare corporations that is today located in the USX Tower downtown Pittsburgh. So it has now become larger than what the U.S. still was. They've, they've swapped places, and that's what's so fascinating to me. Mm -hmm. One corporation damaging the bodies, the other corporation now taking away the health care. And this is what's occurring across America, this mm -hmm. full-on assault against working class people, and in particular elderly people. And I'm mm -hmm. highly sensitive to that, someone being raised by um, their grandmother, and I've noticed this attack and disregard for the elderly, especially after they've worked in this industry and there's no room for them in the knowledge economy. But what's a contradiction to that, what I call the post-industrial paradox, is that we're all gonna become elder, elders. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But we have no respect for the working class or the elderly people who have aged out of being able to work in this large tech boom. Right. And so to see the hospital be torn down while Braddock was being rebranded as the poster child for Rust Belt revitalization just really caused me to come out onto the street and become more socially engaged. So the media wasn't reporting on the loss of our largest employer and our only health care provider. They were telling the other story where they proliferated Braddock as that image of the new frontier. And it's like, well, how could it be a new frontier? Right? The urban pioneers have come. Go, so go back to that intersection uh, in Soho. Right? So there's the ad. I'm walking down the street in For New Levi's. York City one day, and I look up, and it's Braddock. An image about Braddock in Soho, the most expensive billboard slot in this country. It cost millions of dollars to put that billboard there. And, and it, was, it was just, it just crushed me. It, it, it pricked me like the, yeah. like the punctum because I knew that there was a false reality, a propaganda, an illusion about what was really going on in the city. On the one hand, of course, politicians and governments have to make things seem welcoming and beautiful. No one wants to have a horrible city. But there's also the truth behind what's going on there. So if an ad campaign has an image of some horses and some little models in it, and you know it's an industrial landscape, <laughs> does, is that narrative necessary? <laughs> we don't have horses in Braddock. <laughs> so, you know, there's that question about that. Like, okay, if you want to rebrand it, you want to show another image, the type of stories that the corporation was telling uh, didn't quite line up with the reality. And so it became very necessary for me to continue to protest and make other images that would rupture any viewer or consumer's mind that may have been infiltrated by these false images of the town. And so that also led to me doing more performance work where I realized, going back to this performance and the figure and how the body is in the frame, I realized that me walking around is a piece of, of Braddock, it's a piece of that heritage, it's a piece of this steel industry. Um, 
So I was in New York seeing the ads and everyone was moving from Brooklyn to Braddock for cheap houses and studios or the creative class comes to take over the working class. And I decided that I would do this performance, show these gestures where I'm dressed up as a worker and my body is moving in between what a still worker does in the factory. In, in the factory they give signals when they're moving the um, steel around or when they're heating and cooling it, they do signals to move these things. And so in this performance here, I'm moving between doing those signals and also moving as the actual products that were on the conveyor belts. And so I carry out this choreographed movement three times until the denim is shredded. Um, outside of the U.S., when you think about Levi's and denim, it's very much viewed symbolically as America. Mm -hmm. It's Americana. And so to shred them into the ground through these choreographed movements based on labor moves was really deconstructing and decoding it for the viewer. And so what happens is, you know, the sidewalk starts to turn blue from the <laughs> dye, the cotton shreds up, it blows down the street in the wind. And in the end, you just see how I'm dematerializing and deconstructing that type of superficial reading. I mean, ultimately, the creative class can't replace the working class. It's not like these things can give us pensions or take care of people's health and their ailments. And so that symbolic gesture became necessary. And this was in front of, wasn't there a, Le a, a Levi a, party a Levi. inside? They, they <laughs> took it another step further and made a, a, a pop-up photo workshop. So New York City is like a place where there are millions of photographers. So they decided with their, I guess, corporate responsibility to do that um, photo studio there in Soho, which happened to be in Jeffrey Deitch a gallerist, a dealer, a famous dealer's gallery space. So I'm watching my the history and legacy that I come from be proliferated and commercialized. Yep. And so that became my responsibility to say something back to the community and to cut off that type of reading. So I think we're over time. So I'm going to end on this image that shows a number of the performances that LaToya has done over the years because even when we were speaking the performance that I was most familiar with was the Levi performance and then the sort of performative aspect that appears within the works but I hadn't known that there had been all of these other performances that were engaged with workers and sort of really sort of going back to a specific type of um, a costume what am I trying to say not costume but like a, a certain a certain type of clothing that was that evoked a certain period a certain time um, that was very much connected to Braddock and the type of work that was happening there. And with that, um, we will end. Thank you so much, LaToya.